Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never ends. That's our passage today, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. But I want to read the context in a little bit different version by an author named J.B. Phillips, who many years ago did a a translation from the original language into modern English, J.B. Phillips' New Testament in modern English. And I want to set the, the scene for this passage, reading a little bit different wording than we've been used to. If I speak with the eloquence of men and of angels, this is 1 Corinthians 13, but have not love, I become no more than blaring brass or crashing cymbal. If I have the gift of foretelling the future and hold in my mind not only all human knowledge, but the very secrets of God, and if I also have that absolute faith which can move mountains, but have not love, I amount to nothing at all. If I dispose of all that I possess, yes, even if I give my own body to be burned, but have not love, I achieve precisely nothing. This love of which I speak is slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive or, or kind. It is not possessive. It is neither anxious to impress, nor does it cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. It does not pursue selfish advantage. It is not touchy. It does not keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. On the contrary, it is glad with all good men when truth prevails. Love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. It is, in fact, the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. That's a paraphrase from the original language, but it's sometimes good to hear these familiar words in a little bit different wording. And we'll be looking at verse 7 today, but I think it's helpful to hear the whole. Here's what Kenneth Weiss, expanded translation of the Greek New Testament has. Love bears up under all things, not losing heart nor courage. A Greek scholar named Thistleton translates verse 7 this way, Love never tires of support, never loses faith, never exhausts hope, never gives up. Or an alternate translation, There is nothing love cannot face. There is no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. The New Living Translation, Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Or if you have the NIV, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Or it has the power of undergoing all things, having faith in all things, hoping all things. It's always supportive or loyal. Whatever your Bible has, whatever wording, these are these are challenging words. These are words that have been challenging to my heart and soul, and I trust to you as well. As we look at what love is and what love is not, one of the questions I asked on the survey before this series was, was that verses 4 through 7 uses adjectives for what love is or love is not, and, and only 3% of you disagreed, but there's actually no adjectives in the, in the Greek of verses 4 through 7. Everything about love here is a verb, and I that's a little bit of a trick question because in, in English these look like adjectives, but, but actually all of them, all 15 of them are verbs. These are, these are not passive adjectives. These are active verbs of what love chooses to do and what love refuses to do. And so the correct answer is these are all verbs. These are not adjectives, and that will be on the quiz, and you'll get a chance for a makeup quiz soon. But the ISV translation has, love bears up under everything. It believes the best in all. And so I want to look at this verse just with two headings here today. Love bears the worst 
And then love believes and hopes the best. Love bears the worst. And then number two, love believes and hopes the best. And, and this is in relationships. Verses, or chapters 12 through 14 are focused on Christian relationships, although these principles can apply to, to others. But next week we'll see how love endures and doesn't fail at the end of the verse and into verse 8 and following. But there's questions that will be coming up in your mind. How much do we have to endure? How much do we have to cover? And when, what about confronting sin? And some of those questions we'll try to tie together next week. But here's a question that I've asked before. When verse 5 says, love keeps no record of wrongs, is that something you can explain to someone else how, how that relates to forgiving someone who has wronged them often? So it's one thing if it's a, a one-time thing, but if, if they're continually wronging them, how do you keep no record of wrongs? About 20% of you on that question on that survey I gave out weren't confident you could explain that to others. Or here's another question I asked on the forum. Can you help someone understand what it means that love believes all in relation to those who have hurt them or are untrustworthy? What does it mean to believe all when someone is, is not trustworthy? And about half who responded weren't confident how they might explain that. And so my hope is that after today we'll understand more and can help others to both of those questions come to a head in verse 7 for this week and for next week, how love can bear the worst and how love can still believe and hope the best. First, love bears the worst in relationships. We could say the ESV has love bears all things. There's certain things that are not hard to bear. They're, they're lovely things about others, but bearing all things, even that language implies these are things that are not easy to bear. Love has to labor at this. And in the context that Paul is writing to, I hope we all understand more as we've been going through the series, the context of what Paul is, is writing to. The context isn't a wedding, even though we've heard these words maybe at a wedding. The, the context here is a, is a church, the bride of Christ, that has been unloving to each other. This isn't a, a Valentine's Day love poem that Paul is writing here. He's writing about love in very everyday relationships, and in particular, some real strained relationships. That's the context that he's writing to if you read the chapters before and, and after. This is a correction to the Corinthian church, because as you read this book, you saw that they were not being patient and kind. You see that they were being envious, that they were being boastful, they were being proud, they were being rude, they were being self-seeking. All those things are echoes of what we see earlier in the book. Everything in verses 4 through 7 is, is written specifically about issues he's brought up in chapters 1 through 12. So the context is the church and also spiritual gifts, and, and these are tests for how are we doing loving one another? If this is the most important command, and it is, to love God and then to love neighbors, how are we doing in this kind of love? This is very important. And the context here is loving one another, especially in the church. And, and love bears, that language is, it bears what's, what's hard to put up with in others. It bears what's bad about them, what's the worst about them. And, and not just sin, although that's included, but also just, just what's annoying. Well, what's annoying about someone, their worst traits. You could probably sit here and think of someone right now who, who really bothers you. Don't think about it too long, because that, then you might go into sin. But, but there's, there's, there's all of us, there's things that, that bother us, even today. There's worst traits about others. And here's how Paul used the same Greek word in chapter 9, verse 12. He says, we put up with anything, same word, rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So we bear with or we put up with all things rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So that's the, that's the context. That's the, the bigger picture. This is for the sake of Christ's gospel. We need to think higher than, than our own feelings and, and this other person. We need to think about the, the gospel, the King James wording, as we suffer all things 
for the sake of the gospel, the gospel that's about Christ's love. If, if we can't bear sinners, that's an obstacle to people who are watching our lives know that we talk about the love of God in, in Christ, and if they hear and see how we can't bear with sinners in our life, we're, we're putting a stumbling block in the way of our message about Christ's love towards sinners like us. And we're to love as Christ loves. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus is not irritable or resentful. We could go through the whole list. Are you, are you growing in patience and kindness? Are you fighting your tendencies and your temptations to be irritable and to be resentful? Think about the past couple months. Can you think of a, a specific way where you've sought to pursue love in being patient or kind or bearing or enduring sin in ways that you don't normally by nature? Have you been pursuing that specifically? I asked you that a couple of months ago, and around 40% of you could respond with a strong yes. I, I, I pray that that number is higher now, and if it's not yet for you, if you haven't yet sought to pursue being patient and kind and bearing sin in a way that you don't just normally by nature, I, I pray that this day and even this week, you would be pursuing something specific. Because this is where the rubber meets the road. That analogy, even you think of at, while you're driving on the road, while the rubber of your tires is on the road, how are you in these things? How are you doing loving people you struggle with at work or here at church? Are you patiently bearing with your family or are you quickly provoked? Are you becoming more aware of these things? That's one of the ways God helps us grow. We're more aware of it and, and we care about it and we're working on it. If you're honest, some of you don't bear up with those you're around, you can actually be a bear to be around. You know, there's a saying of a poking mama bear, but you can poke papa bear or, or the cubs as well. And, and when someone's been sitting in your chair or doing whatever with your things or your routine, maybe you don't growl, but do you grumble? Do you complain? Here's what Colossians 3 commands you and me. To put on patience and kindness with humility, all the things in 1 Corinthians 13, and it goes on to say, we're commanded to be bearing with one another in love. And if one has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So also you must forgive and above all these things put on love. So bearing all things is the opposite of complaining. And forgiveness is key to put on bearing love. What we do in our heart when things are hard to bear, what you have been complaining about this week, you're commanded there in that passage. You need to forgive where that's needed, and you need to always put on love. And so do I. In that survey that I gave, eight of you admitted that this year you couldn't think of a time where you forgave someone by focusing on God's love for you. And 11 of you couldn't remember a time this year where you've asked forgiveness to someone else. And that's just a sampling. I think the, the respondents were less than half of our adults and, and young adults. And I appreciate the honest confessing that you don't confess your, your sins to others, but I, I pray as you go through 1 Corinthians 13, if you're not convicted and if you're not confessing sin, I think there comes a point where we have to ask ourselves, do, do we know this love ex experientially in our lives and in, in a saving way? And because I love you, I need to urge you to confess Confess where you fall short of 1 Corinthians 13. Confess your need. Confess your sins to God and confess it to others and ask Him to show you where there's things you need to confess 
with others. Ask God to forgive you and others to forgive you when you are unloving. And if you don't yet know this love in a saving way in your life, pray that this would be the day that God would change you, save you, and give you his love so that you can love. And we can also, like the man said, I believe, help my unbelief. We can say, Lord, oh, for grace to love you more and to love others more. One of the questions also that was asked was about reading, pursuing a love relationship with the Lord and, and His Word, and, and, and some admitted that they, they don't do that regularly or, or, or even much at all. Uh, over a, a quarter, some said zero days a week, over a quarter admitted maybe once or twice a week you read for, for five minutes or more. Uh, another good percent said maybe every other day. I, I, I pray... Uh, I pray that that also is going to grow because without our love relationship with the Lord, without spending time with Him, when, when you love someone, you, you communicate with them, you talk to them, they talk to you. God talks to us in His Word. We talk to Him in prayer. We, we, need, to, we need help in that. We need to help each other. And there's a Habits of Grace Sunday School class also that is, that is recognizing that need. We need help sometimes and to help each other just to grow in the basics of of our love relationship with the Lord and prayer and His Word. Sometimes we need accountability from another believer to, to be in his, in his Word. But this is where it starts. It's our, our love for the Lord is where it needs to start. Because if, our love, if we're not loving the Lord, we're not going to be able to love others. And so just like we talk with people we love, talk with God. Ask His help to grow in love. And I think about 30 of you ad admitted that you couldn't think of a time this year where you, you put a truth that you learned on Sunday into practice that you don't normally, or, or a, a good number uh, shared that they haven't shared something about a Sunday message with another believer to try to encourage him in the truth that they've heard together, or, or couldn't think of a recent example where someone else had spurred them on towards love in relation to truths that they had heard together. I, I pray that in this time and in this series and even in this week, if you're not already pursuing that, that you would be walking in this more. And it's because I, I love you that I, I have to urge you and encourage you that we need each other. We need the Lord. And this is most important. The, the love for the Lord and love for others is the most important command. And so this is so important to us. And so if you're not already, let today be the day that you consider how you might stir someone else to love before you leave here even. Or this day or this, or this week. And thinking of this phrase now, if love bears all things, who do you need to love by bearing their failings. This was our scripture reading earlier, Romans 15. We have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. And this is for the sake of unity and God's glory there in Romans 15. The middle of Ephesians says, To God be the glory in the church, therefore walk worthy and humbly and patiently, gently. It says, bearing with one another in love. And so love bears... For God's glory and, and church unity, that's the big picture. And, and that chapter goes on to talk about there, are, there is time to confront sin, to speak truth in what? In love. We need to do that in, in love, Ephesians 4, verse 15. But we also need to keep, as it says, to not let the sun go down in our anger. Don't go to bed angry. Keep bearing. Keep being kind. Keep being tenderhearted. Keep forgiving one another just as God and Christ forgave you. And walk in love as Christ loved us. But it's got to be God-centered. Thinking of His glory. We're not going to be able to, to bear all things without God's help. We've got to believe the promise that God will not tempt us or give us beyond what we are able to Bear, but with that temptation or with that struggle, He will give us grace to endure. Not necessarily to escape, but to endure, to bear up under it. The Psalms say sin and its consequences can overwhelm like a burden too heavy to 
bear. But the Psalms say, blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God's love bears all things about His people all the time. And He gives His love that can bear all things. So think of this promise in Isaiah 46. When things are hard for us to bear, God promises, I will bear you and I will deliver you. To your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying years, I will bear you. I was just thinking about that wonderful promise as I look out at graying years among us here. God has been fulfilling that very promise, sustaining, bearing up his people. And it's, it's good for us to even talk to those who have grayer hair than us, to ask them, how has God worked in your life? How has he borne you up? There's a great uh, blog Pastor Corey wrote just about honoring those who are gray-haired among us. Here's what Isaiah 53 said, the Messiah would bear our griefs. So it's not just our sins, he bears our griefs. The Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, he bears our griefs, he bears our sorrows so that we can bear those things. It says he would bear their iniquities, he would bear the sin of many. And maybe there's some times you wonder, well, how long am I going to have to bear with this person? Well, look to Jesus next time you wonder that. Because Jesus actually, in his humanity, he, he, he said this on one occasion, Oh, faithless, how long am I to bear with you? Jesus knows that, that temptation and even that wondering, how long am I going to have to bear? He was tempted in every way as, as we are, but he didn't sin. But he knows that temptation, Hebrews 4 says, and, and he goes on there to help the sufferer. And he, he ministered, he continued to bear all things with some very hard-to-bear disciples. That's in Matthew 17. So he's tempted in every way, but he, he, wasn't, he didn't sin in response to that temptation. But in time of need, that's what Hebrews 4 says, in time of need, we can find his mercy. We can find his help. We can find grace in time of need, knowing that our Savior knows what that's like. He lived 30 plus years among very hard to bear people. And he even knows what it's like. How long am I going to have to bear? And Hebrews also 13 says that we can bear the reproach that he bore. We can bear his disgrace Bearing the insult or the abuse, even as it talks about there. Bearing shame and scoffing rude. Some of the hymns talk about this. On the cross, my burden, he was gladly bearing. He bled and died to take away my sin. All right, I love this line, my sin, the, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. It's, it's nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. That's, that's the gospel right there. He bears our sins and our sorrows and all the consequences of that, so we bear them no more. And so Christ, in Revelation, who upholds, who bears up the churches in His hands, He, he commends there in Revelation 1, the believers who are bearing up, He says, for my name's sake. If you're bearing up, Christian, he, he, he's, He's commending you there in Revelation. He's giving a blessing to those who are bearing up under, under sin and, and suffering. He went to Calvary, Scripture says, bearing His own cross and, and bearing our sins in His body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He died for our sin. He bears our sins so that we could die to sin and bear the sins of others. All the things that are wrong about us, which are many, He bears daily. And so we need to look to his love to bear the wrongs of others. Christ-like love bears the worst. But we need to also see love in this verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, believes and hopes the best in relationships. Look again at verse 7. Love bears all things and believes all things. And remember the context here isn't Strangers, this is a context about spiritual relationships. You might even be wondering in your mind, well, are we supposed to believe all things from those who are unknown to us or unbelievers or think of a, a chronic 
manipulator? Am I supposed to just believe all things he says? But even as Christians, we also know Christians can be biased. We can be biased. But I want you to notice it doesn't say believes all things people say. It doesn't say that. In fact, it literally just believes all. And so you have to understand what is this all that we are to believe. We know from Scripture it's not loving to believe all things other people might tell you, like like what a, a Mormon might tell you about how you get to the celestial kingdom or, or what a, a Roman Catholic might tell you, all these works you have to do to try to not be in purgatory as long. We don't just believe all those things that are contrary to Scripture. Even if a, a person might come up to you with, with alcohol on their breath and give you a sad story about why they need money for food, love doesn't have to believe all the things that he's saying and and love may actually consider how to help without doing something that might just get him more alcohol you don't have to believe all things that you hear on your voicemail about extending your car warranty i've gotten like 30 of those i don't know if i'm maybe i'm not the only one you don't have to believe all things you see in an email about someone in india or nigeria who needs some help and would like your bank account information okay this is this is not talking about believing all things and if a stranger pulls up in a car and invites little kids over they're they're not to believe all things he says that would not be loving in order we have to trust all things our government tells us trust us this is effective and safe for your little kids. Just believe us. Love needs to discern what to trust when it's hard to know what to trust in this world and for what we put in our, our bodies, but also what we put in the minds of ourselves and our, our little ones. We need to be discerning. Love is discerning. And love believing the best doesn't mean you believe others know what is best for you and your family, or or even what others would teach about the family and biology and gender, identity. We're not to just believe all those things that our world would say. It's because we love our kids that we can't believe all things that are taught to them on history or racially or sexually or whatever the woke philosophy is going to bring Next, I don't believe all things the science says about evolution or other things that are political and, and financial. As, as loving parents, we don't entrust our role to others. The, the church wants to support parents with whatever choices they make about school or other areas where Christians differ, but we're not to take that role either. The, the Lord has called you, but also has called all of us to love each other. And in this context, in in controversial things, we also need to love each other who make different decisions and believe the best about Christians who make different decisions. This is is important. Who are we to trust is, is the question before us. The Bible commands us, do not put your trust in princes. Those would be leaders. That could include all levels of society. There are times where the Bible commands us not to believe all things. But Isaiah 8:12 on the other side also warns against false conspiracies and it says, "Do not fear what they fear." We're not to live in fear like the world, but we're also not to steer stir up fear with doubtful information or conspiracy theories either. We don't trust politicians to not be political. But we also need to, on the other side, not believe all things that are said negatively about those we disagree with. I think loving Christians should not believe all things that they see or, sh- or be quick to share things or, or, or tweet all things that may not be trustworthy. I think we need to rejoice in the truth and be very careful with the truth. But ultimately, what we need to see beyond all that is our ultimate trust needs to be in God. Not what I say, not what... Another person says, our ultimate trust and hope needs to be in God. Not anyone else out there in the world and what they might do. It needs to be in God. We are to believe all things he says. 
And, and here's something else. We're not even to trust our own hearts. Because our hearts can be deceitful. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Sometimes we need counsel. We need help in some of these difficult things. But even in church, Paul is going to write in the next chapter that others should weigh carefully what is said. Not just believe all things people say. That's chapter 14, verse 29. Just because one of us is standing up here doesn't mean you should believe all things we say. You need to examine them, weigh carefully what is said next to Scripture. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5, he doesn't say trust all things. He says test all things, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. And that's in the context of putting on love. We need to examine everything carefully. The Bereans didn't believe all things Paul said, and they were commended for that. They actually examined what he said to see if it was so. Proverbs 14, 15, the naive believes everything, but the sensible man considers. And so 1 Corinthians 13, 7 is not talking about believing everything without sensible consideration. And this hoping all things isn't just a naive optimism. Biblical love is not gullible. It's not susceptible to deception. One writer says, this doesn't make us into foolish Pollyannas. No offense to Pollyanna fans, but I think you get the reference. The King James Version uses the phrase in 1 Corinthians 13, love thinks no evil. In other words, it doesn't impute evil motives. It doesn't just believe the worst about a fellow believer in this context in the church, why they did or said something. Those you're in relationship and are in your life who you know. Paul actually said in chapter 4 of this letter that we're not to judge the motives of other people's hearts. That's what God is to judge. The, the purposes, the motives of their hearts. We're not to judge that we know why they did something. And, and if there's doubt, love chooses to, to give the benefit of the doubt in relationships and to loved ones. So maybe they did something or said something and, and the reason why is a little bit ambiguous in your mind. Love is going to choose to be generous in its judgment about that. And it can, it can talk to them about that and, and get clarity but love believes, I think this is a helpful way to think about it, it believes in all things God is working for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. He is doing his best work in them, and we're going to believe in that. And even where unbelievers might intend something for evil, God intends it for good, as Joseph told his brothers. And I think Jesus, again, is our example. We've seen this throughout the series. Jesus didn't trust those untrustworthy Jewish leaders. He didn't believe all things in even some of those who professed belief in him in John chapter 2. It uses the same word. He didn't entrust himself to them. Peter says this, 1 Peter 2, verse 22, Jesus left you an example to follow in his steps. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges rightly. So that's where his trust was as he continued to, to work with his disciples that we might have given up hope in. We might have lost faith in some of those disciples, but he continues entrusting himself to, to God and believing in all things that, that his father was at work in, in sinful Peter. It wasn't because Peter was so trustworthy. Peter wasn't doing a lot to, to build trust, but Jesus was entrusting him to God. Even when Peter denied him, which was grievous. Jesus didn't lose faith in God's plan for Peter, and he didn't see Peter as a hopeless case. Is there someone you think of as a hopeless case? There's been people sometimes maybe think they're never going to turn to the Lord. They're, they're hopeless. There's testimonies in this room of people that were thought they would never come to know the Lord, and they came to, to know the Lord. We're, we're not to give up hope. But this believing or faith and hope go together with love. In fact, if you look at verse 13, faith, hope, and love continue these three. The greatest of these 
is love. So this believing all and this hoping all, or, or faith and hoping and love go together in Scripture. And so verse 7 says, not only love believes or has faith, it also hopes all things. And I think that fills out the, the picture of believing. This faith or this hope isn't ultimately in man. It is in God at work in man to bring what's best. It's, it's not that we're believing and, and hoping everything in man. Our hope is not on, on man alone. It's in God who is at work in man to bring his best about. We trust and hope and even have confidence that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to what? To complete it. We, we believe that. That's what gave Paul hope in the Philippians, Philippians 1.6. And this Hope is not wishful thinking. Sometimes there's something really unlikely that you say, I, I hope that happens, but this is not that kind of hope. Belief and hope look forward, and they ultimately look Godward to what he's doing in people and what he's doing in events. So if it was just based on what we see around us or even what we see in us, we, we could lose hope pretty quickly, but we've got to realize there is a sovereign and good God at work in all things, at all times. And so that's how we can believe and hope in all things. That he is bringing about what's best for us. And so it's been said, hopes all things means to look forward with confidence, to expect the best. Ultimately, the conviction that God's going to be at work showing mercy in a person's behalf. No matter how grim things look, we don't give up that hope. And to believe all things means God is going to work out his plans and that object of trust is the potential good in others and in God's ability to bring good out of evil. So Paul's going to tell this Corinthian church later that we need to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Our thoughts can quickly go towards a negative judgment, can't they? I mean, all of us, we, we see something, we hear something, someone does this or does that. They look at us a certain way, they come across a certain way, and we have no idea what all is going on in their life, and we can quickly personalize what might not even be personal at all. We can think they're thinking evil things about us, and they might not even be thinking about us at all, but there's something bothering them, and, and, and we see that. Uh, we can quickly have these thoughts that just run, and then maybe at, at night we're thinking about it again, or, or we're, we just latch on to a, a particular thought, and we can't let it Lie. Well, here's some, what a counselor, some biblical counselor gives. How to take our thoughts captive to make them obedient to Christ. To, to begin to counsel ourselves. What, what is it that I'm believing? Do I know this to be true about this other person and their attitudes? What do I think he or she thinks that's fueling my emotions? Making captive thoughts is, is asking, are my assumptions, are they kind? Are they respectful versus rude in, in verse 5? Am I motivated by love and concern for that person, or is it about me? Am I personalizing what may not be personal? This writer says, this counselor writes from experience, to open a heart shut to closeness requires a commitment to trust and to hope despite the hurt. Trusting and hoping also grows out of faith in the God who is always at work in the hearts and lives of his people to continually transform them into Christ likeness. This is huge, brothers and sisters. This is a huge point. If, if, you, if you miss everything else, don't miss this point. Paul knew experientially the damage that can come when there is assumption wrongly. When he came into Jerusalem in Acts 20, and this ended up taking years of his life, it says they assumed that he had brought this Greek Trophimus into the very holy place that only Jews were to go. That wasn't true, but they assumed that. And then all of Paul's legal troubles that ensued after that were, were because they made a false assumption. They believed and assumed that he had actually done something that he hadn't done. Job knew about this when he says, Stop assuming my guilt, for I have not done wrong. Solomon warns, fools base their thoughts on foolish assumptions. And so this is uh, such an important subject, and, and I've, I've got to share with you what wiser men than me have said on this. D.A. Carson says, Love prefers to be generous in its openness and acceptance rather than suspicious or cynical. 
Think about, is your tendency to be suspicious and cynical of your beloved, those you're in relationship with? Love hopes for the best, even when disappointed by a repeated personal hurt, hoping against hope and always ready to give an offender a second chance. Love doesn't give up hope in loved ones. That would be another way to say that. As we think of those that we love here at this church, John MacArthur says, if there's doubt about a person's guilt or motivation, love will always opt for the most favorable possibility. So you think, I don't know exactly what they meant or why they said that, but I can think of an unfavorable possibility. What's the most favorable one? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that until it's been proven otherwise. If a loved one is accused of something wrong, love will actually consider him innocent until proven guilty. Sometimes we think, well, that's okay for the law court, but not for the love of Christians. No, love should at least do what our law courts do. Consider them innocent until proven guilty. If they do turn out to be guilty, we can still trust and and hope that they didn't mean it exactly the way that we felt it. Whenever there's doubt, he says, we should rather err on the favorable side. Hatred believes the worst. Love believes the best. Love is a harbor of trust. Even when belief in a loved one's goodness or repentance is shattered, it still hopes. And when it runs out of faith, which can happen sometimes, there's still this hope to hold on to as, as we, we've, we've, we've lost that faith, but we still have this hope. And, and think about God's treatment of Israel. He didn't treat Israel's failure as final. Paul, as he's writing to these Corinthians about their failures, he's not seeing their failures as final. Jesus did not see Peter's failures as final. We keep hoping, and so there's, there's, if you have backslidden children that have walked away from the Lord, and you don't see hope in that, or spouses of an unbelieving marriage partner, or uh, members who have been disciplined who do not repent, we don't give up hope. We don't take failure as final. As long as there is life and breath, even that thief on the cross to the end, there was hope for him. The rope of love's hope has no end. Look at that picture. The rope of love's hope, it just keeps going. And we hold on to that when there's nothing else. This hope can be an anchor for the soul. And it's not that we know the future. It's not that we're going to get all the things that we desire. But we're hoping in God. Even when we're in despair, Psalm 42, the the waves of emotions are crashing over him. And and there's some relational difficulty. He's not able to be with God's people anymore. But he says, why are you in despair, O my soul? Here's what he says, hope in God. I will yet praise him. The the help of my countenance and my God. That's where if you feel like you're losing hope, Psalm 42 It's a great psalm to to help you preach to yourself, to say to your soul, why are you in despair? Hope in God. Don't give up your hope in God. Because of this, we don't need to write off a fellow believer. Love isn't hopeless even with unbelievers in your life. This This is unbelievably important. And this can literally change our lives if we can actually change what we are believing about others, what we tend to assume and think can make such a big difference. And there's so much damage in relationships in this church that could be prevented if we ask instead of assume. And until we have to assume, if we have to assume or judge, we assume and judge the best. And through all that, we bear what is hurtful. And we continue to be hopeful. We can be hopeful that maybe, even though that was hurtful, they didn't quite intend it the way it felt. We can hope that maybe matters can be explained and made clear, and we're going to hold on to this hope until all possibility of such a result has vanished. There was a professor of mine who gave a story years ago at church. Just thinking about the, I was talking about body language earlier, or how someone came across. He was going up to some lady to talk to her, and he's walking over to her, and she does this. Sticks up her nose and just walks right out of church. He's like, I'm just going over to see how you're doing. She literally stuck her nose up at me and walked right out of church. 
You, you can see where that could have gone in his mind and his thinking. So he, he reached out to her and said, hey, sister, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't know if I did anything to offend you or if something was going on, but I, I was wanting to connect with you at church. It seemed like maybe you were upset. She said, oh, my nose was running like crazy. I didn't even, I didn't even see you coming. My nose, I was about to have snot come out. Is that okay to say in church? I'm about to have snot come out. And so I literally, all I could do is stick, stick my nose up, and i, I got to get to my car as fast as possible. So I just walked right out of the building. You see, that's, that's an example of where you could have seen that. That ultimately could have done great damage in their relationship, but, but it's, it's not always what you think or see. And that's a little bit of a funny example, but the, I, that makes the point we need to be very careful. Not to jump to conclusions, even if we can't even think of any other explanation for what they did. And if there is sin, which does happen not only with them, with us, love doesn't lose faith or hope in God. Believing, seeing the best in others, hoping all, meaning refusal to take failure as final. This isn't the end of the story. It's the confidence that looks to the ultimate triumph through the grace of God. There are no hopeless cases where God's love is at work. And if someone proves untrustworthy or not believable, Matthew Henry says, well, love will yet hope well and continue to hope as long as there's any ground for it. It won't conclude a case desperate, but it wishes the amendment of the worst of men apt to hope even some who you may not be able to have a close relationship with as you think of them. You don't think with bitterness. You still keep praying, Lord, I, I want to pray and I'm going to believe and I'm going to hope that you're going to work in that person's life. You may need to use other people than me to work in his life, but I pray and I hope for that person. And if that person comes up to your mind again who you're struggling with, continue to seek to pray in that way. Lord, I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe and I'm going to hope that you're going to help this person in their life, even if that can't be me. This is vital in relationships, to believe the best and, and without having all the facts in, to put the best, best possible interpretation on the facts. So their body language, their tone of language, you don't know what's going on in their life and their mind. And, and, and love can care and want to know what's going on and want to help. But love also believes in all things. There's more to the story that we don't know. And when we hear things from others, we need to have that instinct. And what we think we know may have been misunderstood. I've seen that so many times, not just with others, but with myself. And so trust on a human level can accept or begin to, by assuming this person meant well, when there's not solid reasons to the contrary, or we can even believe that I think that was a bad decision. But I, I'm, I still am going to believe that God's good is at work in this person and this is something that doesn't come natural for us. This is a supernatural work of God. Because our, our natural instinct in our flesh is to think the best about ourselves and to think the worst about others. I mean, we're, we're good at that. We're, we're natural at assuming the best about our, our own hearts and assuming the worst about others. But you know what the gospel actually does? The, the gospel actually turns that upside down. It actually reminds us we're a bigger sinner than other people know. Because we know our heart. We know we don't love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength or love neighbors as our much. They might be accusing me of something I didn't do, but there's a lot of things I, I did do that they don't even know about. I'm a big sinner, but I have a great Savior, and I'm going to, because of that, focus on, on my own sin, the log that I have. And, and yes, there are specks in these others, but, and I need to help them sometimes, but I'm going to start with seeing myself and my sin as, as bigger and what I'm responsible for and not the other person. And I'm going to, if I don't have facts otherwise, I'm going to assume actually the best about others. And there's something wonderful that can happen when we do that. We see God's, we're looking for God's grace, hoping for it. We can see God's grace when it's at work. We can celebrate that. And also we're, we're just more pleasant to be around. <laughs> when we are loving in this way that this verse says. And when we're challenged, or we feel challenged, we can still give a, a charitable interpretation of what they're saying and, and listen to it constructively. Here's what I want to do as we close here. I want to pray for God's help in this. We need God's help in this. 
And I, there's a prayer that I, I think just puts this together. It's from the Journal of Biblical Counseling. Help me to think rightly. So I'm going to pray these words. But I encourage you, if, if this is your heart, to pray it along with me in your heart silently. Lord, help me to think of others and to judge others the way that I would want them to think about me and judge me. Help me to think charitably and not critically. Help me to address things privately and not publicly, gently and not harshly, in humility and not pride. Help me to believe and to hope the best about others until facts prove otherwise to assume nothing, to seek all sides of the story, and to judge no one until I have removed the log from my own eye. And may I never bring only the law to find fault and to condemn, to focus on their sin, but Lord, help me to start with mine and to always bring the gospel and to give hope and that there's deliverance for our sin and those we struggle with. And I pray these things to you, who is the only judge who judges rightly, but who is also our friend in the gospel. We ask that you would help us to love as you, as you have so graciously done to us. And all God's people who pray these things said, Amen. Amen.